Ahoy! The Empyrean Forge expedition came out this week and it's easily my favorite expedition along with Enyad. This one is a bit of a challenging one, especially for people playing it for the first time that are not familiar with the mechanics, and I wanted to give you a basic guide, just a beginner intro guide to this expedition, how to do it smoothly and what mechanics you need to pay attention to, as well as finding all the gather balls, including the hidden one, and also some skips. At the end of this video, I will also give you some tips regarding gear for this expedition. Let's begin with the expedition itself. You will see our tank doing relatively generous pulls at some spots. Obviously, you don't have to go that fast if you're a new inexperienced group, but generally a lot of the larger pulls do tend to make things a little bit easier, and I will talk about the specific spots where you want to do smaller pulls. You want to pay attention to the rangers here, which can deal quite a lot of damage to your squishies, and the man-at-arms, which can stun you, which can be quite annoying. Generally, you see a lot of player mechanics on these mobs, so that's something to generally pay attention to. You'll see many abilities that you're familiar with from PvP. The next group here with the two rangers we typically kill in the spot that they're in, simply because they have two rangers and otherwise you have to kite those around. After that, you run into some fire elementals. Uh, these are not particularly strong, though. You want to watch out with the detonation a bit, and yeah, otherwise they are fairly easy to kill. You will see those throughout the expedition multiple times. I would still kill them by themselves before pulling them on. And also to the side of them, you see a dragon glory that you want to pick up. After that, you already have your first respawn point, and then you have a group of mobs that you need to kill in order to even start opening the door behind them. This group has a healer, a hospital cleric, so you definitely want to focus this guy first. He will otherwise be able to heal the enemies, anti-heal is also useful in that regard, and then afterwards you focus the man-at-arms. Once the door is open, you enter into a large room and here you can do a relatively big pull. What's important is that the tank takes aggro for most things, because there are rangers and stuff that can hit your healer for example, and the DPS should immediately focus on the clerics. There is a cleric on each side of the room, so you want to take both of them down, maybe take down a ranger in between if your healer needs help, but otherwise the clerics are your first goal, so that you can actually kill the other enemies. After that, you usually best off focusing the rangers, and then you can deal with the other mobs, the skirmishers and Freyr. Freyr uses a hammer and can shockwave you, so you want to make sure to either dodge or even block that. You can ignore the constructs to your sides, because we will need to activate them first, and for that we need to do the next pull. Here I can say that you can absolutely do smaller pulls than we are doing. Uh, you can kind of pull the individual groups. What we are doing is pulling the group around the corner so they're all more grouped up, especially with the ranged mobs. This can be a little bit risky though if not everyone is going around the corner because then they get focused by the archers. There's also a mage in this group that you need to watch out for because you can deal pretty big AoE damage. So if you're able to focus them first, that is usually ideal. And there is another mob just around the corner, which you want to be careful not to pull ideally, which is labeled as a mage, but is actually a cleric, a healer. So if you pull this mob, then he will start healing all the other mobs. So if you end up doing that, then I would recommend just focusing him first. But usually you can just not pull him in the first place and just fight around the corner from him and then just solo him afterwards or pull him up to the next group if you want to. In the next group, there is another healer as well, another cleric, so that's once again the first target, while the tank just holds aggro of everything else. Once the cleric is down, again, he's called mage, but he is a cleric, you can start activating the orb. You'll have one person activating the orb, while the rest of the people kill the other mobs, because the other mobs are not really much of a threat. Once the Ancient Aethos seal is fully activated, you want to head over to the other side, the opposite side, where you will find more mobs. This is the first real challenging fight in the expedition, and I have tried different methods for it. So far we haven't found an ideal one, but generally what we found is that pulling the mobs away from the initial room itself is easiest. So what a big problem with this fight is, is that Sir Eld can drop some electric damage, some shock damage, and this shock damage will just be massive to everyone because no one is really running specific ward from an expedition because you're running flame ward plus whatever the weekly attunement is. And yeah, it just deals tons and tons of damage and it also comes with a stamina drain effect afterwards. So it's very, very painful to deal with. Especially in this week's mutation with him having Slicer and the Grim Orb going around, it is very, very annoying to deal with him and the two mages at the same time. Our theory is, which we unfortunately didn't get around to testing before this video, that you're probably best off single target pulling only the main mob, the Sir Eld, as the tank, and not aggroing the mages, pulling him far away so he drops his slicers on the tank, 
and then having the DPS focus on the mages, because the mages don't really do much single target damage, they just do their AoE spells, so that way you can at least deal with the mages without having to deal with the slicer and the green orb as well. You definitely want to kill the mages first, and you also have to be careful about positioning, because otherwise you may end up pulling the rangers that are relatively close to this area. So the further you pull these mobs away, the better essentially. After that, it gets a lot easier though. You only have to kill a few extra rangers if you haven't killed them already, if they didn't come down, and a few extra mobs. And while the group does that with four people, one of the group's players can already run up to activate the next switch. You need to talk to the NPC in order to do that, and then you can enable it. And next to that NPC, is also a platinum vein that you want to pick up. While one of the group members is doing that, the rest can head back to the main room and actually solve the puzzle. The puzzle itself is quite simple. In the west you will find a platform that you can stand on, and if you do, it shows you the three signs that you need to switch the wheels on the right side to. However, one person needs to keep standing on the platform because otherwise the order of these icons changes. If you want to do it as quickly as possible, then put three people on the wheels so each of them can rotate one of the wheels to the right position. The next room has a fiery surprise. The fire elemental, the heal, is over here, and he will knock you down if you're not careful with your positioning because he spawns these fire circles that detonate after a brief moment, so be careful where you step and when you step there. Also in this room is a gather roll on the very bottom, there's a little fire plant, so you want to make sure to pick that up along the way as well. Ideally, the tank pulls the heal into the next room where you don't have to worry about him knocking more people off the edges. In this room you can just clear him once and then he will spawn again along with an ad and you just clear him again. I'm not quite sure why he spawns twice there. Uh, that is an intended part of how he follows you through the dungeon though. Keep in mind that the heal is a lost mob so your bane and ward won't work but you typically don't have to switch to a lost set for this guy. He really doesn't do that much damage. Moving on to the foundry we once again have to deal with the games of the heal. There is technically a shortcut to the right here, but that is very risky with a lot of builds, so we will not get into that here. Instead, we are taking the long path along the left, where you have to hop across a few platforms and watch out with the fire explosions once again. And then afterwards, you have to watch out for the stompers. You can actually make it through both of these stompers here in a single run if you're quick, but you definitely want to be careful because these things one-shot you. Now, you may be inclined to run up straight away here, but if you want to get all gatherables, there is a hidden gatherable here. If you turn to the left instead, then you will notice that there is a little bit of a stone that is kind of like elevated just slightly, and from there you want to turn around and then you just want to follow the way back up, and there's one Ori node at the very end here that you want to gather. While one person is doing that, the others can usually already start fighting the heal. Again, the heal himself doesn't really do that much, so he isn't really a big threat. So the rest of the players just follows the parkour. There are, again, shortcuts here that you can technically do if you, for example, have Leaping Strike as a tank, but it doesn't really seem all that necessary to me, because unless you have a full team of everyone having mobility to do that, you're probably better off just going into the arena at the same time. As a ranged player, you can actually stay upstairs and the healer can stay upstairs as well, so only the melees and the tank need to be down with the heal and his adds, which is very convenient. Once he's cleared, you want to make sure to look to the right before you enter the next room, because there is an Ori node there. There's also one of the quest ores here, I'm not going to talk about the other ones because they're super visible, they are really highlighted, and the quest is disabled at the moment, so it doesn't really matter right now. Then on the way to the left we have a Scorch Zone, you want to make sure to pick that up. And then it is time to switch to full flame protection, because now it's time to face Ifrit. Ifrit is the first boss in the expedition and has quite a few interesting mechanics that you absolutely want to pay attention to. By the way, in this Meek's mutation, the weary debuff can still apply during this fight and it's going to be really painful in certain situations, so be careful of that. The first mechanic that Ifrit does is spawn flame waves from the southeast of the dungeon. So this is something that you want to pay attention to because it often comes along with flame bombs dropping as well. You can actually lay down and avoid the damage of the flame waves that way and then roll out of the bombs, but that's not always the best way. If you're in light armor, you can also roll straight through them. You can do that in medium or heavy as well, but you have to be a lot more precise. So in light, it's a lot more reliable in my opinion. Next, if it has a slam attack, the ground gets marked in a cross shape, in an X shape, and if it slams down in four different locations. When this happens, you definitely want to get out of melee range, 
because that is a very heavy hitting slam. Should one of your teammates die, make sure not to revive them during a fire pool. As you can also see, sometimes the fire waves will happen without meteors dropping down and sometimes you'll have meteors without fire waves, so it's not all always connected. One thing that we found in a more recent run is that it's actually easier to have the tank on the other side. If the tank is towards the southeast, then the tank is the last one to see the flame waves, which is fine because the tank can easily survive the flame waves anyways, whereas everyone else, including the melee DPS, will be able to see the flame waves much earlier and therefore will be able to avoid them better. So I would suggest actually having the tank run into the room and towards the southeast side right away and have the DPS exactly opposite from where we tanked it in most fights that you're seeing. But there are more mechanics to Ifrit. Eventually you will see two lines on the ground instead of the four from the cross and this is the flamethrower attack. If it slowly turns around, spins around and has this flamethrower on two sides initially and you definitely do not want to touch that because that can instantly kill you. You can technically dodge through that but again this has to be frame perfect unless you're in light so I would not recommend doing that if you can avoid it. Eventually Ifrit starts spawning more lava puddles and then does a bigger cross. This is not a slam, this is the spinning flamethrower, but this time it's in four directions. This is one of the most dangerous situations of the fight because you have to deal with the puddles being on the ground while also watching out not to get one shot by this flamethrower. And she doesn't really stop with her mechanics, the mechanics generally seem to speed up towards the end of the fight, she seems to enter some form of enrage and when she does she will do the slams more often and she will do flame waves relatively frequently and also have lava puddles on the ground. Depending on how quickly you kill her you can also get the cross flamethrower multiple times. Now while Ifrit does flamethrower, there are certain melee spots where you can still fight without getting hit by it, but I would argue it's probably not worth the risk because if you just clip into one of the flamethrowers, you're instantly dead, so I would probably not recommend doing that. Once you've survived this massive, but in my opinion, very fun inferno, it's time to switch gear again and have one person go over to the side of the room to activate the orb so that the next gate opens. Once you're there, you'll find some stompers that you want to walk past. Now there is a group of mobs here that you can technically pull into the stompers but it seems to be very unreliable so we have just started killing them normally instead instead of struggling for way longer trying to get them into the stompers. There is a mage here so that should once again be your first priority. If you're feeling confident here you can pull all groups together but it makes things a lot more hectic so we just pull the first part alone and then the second part after that. In the second part, you have a named mob that you want to prioritize. This is an Ice Mage, so he will deal a fair bit of damage. Sir Bishop should be your first target, and once he's down, you can deal with the adds. Next, you have to open up a door which leads into a little ambush, but this one is actually very fun, because instead of killing the mobs, you can pull them up to the Stumpers. And the Stumpers will, in most situations, take care of at least most of the mobs. You're gonna try and just push them towards it, have your tank run around between the Stumpers so the mobs follow him, and that usually is enough to clear these mobs very, very quickly. You can also completely skip these mobs if you want to, because they can't really follow you down to the next spot, but then your mages and your healer have to jump down too. So that's up to you, just depends on how many mobs in the expedition you want to kill, but technically, numbers-wise, that is fine to do. Then you have two named mobs at once, you definitely want to kill Lady Bridget here first, because she is a healer. This room is very annoying because you have all the mutations effects from two mobs at once, so you have multiple slicers, multiple green orbs, whatever it is. So definitely focus the healer here so that you can get rid of at least one of the mobs and its effects very quickly. And then afterwards the second mob, Sianolin, is actually pretty easy. There is an Orichalcum vein in the lava here, so you have to hop a bit carefully and pick that one up along the way. There's a Forge Skirmisher on the way up, ideally your tank stuns that one because otherwise it may just end up knocking someone down. And then in the next room when you're upstairs you want to kind of pull the mobs back a bit so you don't have to fight on that ledge. Uh, Sir Skarin himself is relatively bursty so you want to be careful, he has a bow, uh, is the name mob of this group, the other ones aren't really much of a problem. But yeah, ideally pull them around the corner a bit more than we did here because then you can just avoid a lot of the annoyance that comes with this fight. 
of all the situations in the expedition, this is actually one of the ones where we had the most unexpected death uh, on players because he actually does a lot of damage if you don't stand in the right position. In the next segment, you can kill the ranger and the skirmisher by himself if you want to play it very safe. Uh, otherwise, you can head a little bit further down, that's what we usually do, but then you definitely want to focus the cleric first. You get that group together there and then you can kill the ranger after the cleric and then clear out everything else. You can pull even more mobs here, but you want to be careful with that because you don't want to pull the next group after that as well, since that has another cleric. Once you get to this group, you definitely again want to focus the cleric first and then clear out the rest. Now there is a puzzle to your side, but we will go to that a little bit later because you definitely want to have your full group for the next room. In this room you find many fun things. First thing is a cleric, you should definitely focus that first if you're DPS. You have the named mob here, which has a blunderbuss. This is ideally tanked from a little bit of range by the tank, so that he doesn't take too much unnecessary damage from the blunderbuss. Also, this mob spawns mines on the ground, so be very careful not to step into those. And then there is also a puzzle here, and you have to be careful not to accidentally, like we always do, step on the platform, because that starts spawning mobs, which will keep spawning continuously. So you definitely want to try and avoid stepping on the platform, deal with the cleric first, then deal with the other mobs, and then deal with the blunderbuss named mob himself. This makes things a lot less hectic. As a melee, make absolutely sure to stay behind this guy because he has his blast shot and if you're in front of him, he kind of jumps back a little bit and even if you're on the side, that can clip into you and then it deals tons and tons of damage. After that, you want to keep some people downstairs, I would say three people downstairs to deal with the ghosts and have one of them standing on the platform so you know what the symbols are. Meanwhile, you can have two people going upstairs and one of them deals with the ghost while the other one does the puzzle. If you climb around from the back, you actually are on the wrong side, so you want to go around to the other side of the puzzle. And you can technically do the puzzle from this side as well. You basically have to do it backwards in that case and then just flip it over twice. Uh, this is possible and avoids aggro on the ghost, which is nice if you only have one person going upstairs. But if you can get a second person to come with you, it just goes way quicker, way easier, and they can just keep that ghost busy. Upstairs behind the puzzle is a platinum ore as well, that's a little bit hidden that you want to pick up. In the east of the room downstairs is another gatherable that can be picked up by somebody who stayed downstairs. Once the puzzle is solved, the ghosts all despawn, by the way. Next, there's a small kind of pointless group of mobs, not really sure why that's even there. And then we get to the final boss. Make sure to step a little bit to the left here so you pick up the respawn point, it doesn't always activate otherwise. And make sure to once again switch back to your flame protection gear. Now this guy is where a lot of groups struggle. Marcus has an absolute arsenal of weaponry and also the room he's in is very very small. The more flame protection you have, the easier this fight gets. What's nice about him is that he doesn't really have many back cleaving attacks, there's only really one that he very very rarely does, so you can very freely melee him if you get him in the right position. He has multiple mechanics that he doesn't always do in the same order, but usually he starts the fight with a whirlwind spinning at one of the players. The attacks can be somewhat controlled by the tanks with good positioning and good distancing, but they aren't always reliably aimed at the tank only. Even if the tank still has aggro, they can switch to other targets if they're far enough away, so don't rely purely on aggro. His first attack, the spinning attack, doesn't do that much damage and you can actually kind of block it even if you're not a tank, so you don't have to be too scared of the attack itself. But it also launches fire projectiles that fly around the room and those can actually hurt a lot more if you get hit by multiple of them and don't have enough flame protection of any kind. His next major attack is a jumping execute that even splits the ground and creates some fire trails around him. The execute itself hurts a lot and also breaks stamina easily even on tanks, so you're best off dodging it. The fire ground trails don't do much damage, but they stack a fire debuff on you, which all of his fire mechanics do if you get hit by them. We'll talk about those a little bit later. He also has a volcano mechanic, where he spawns various volcanoes across the ground that will explode after a brief moment. And these can also spawn under him, so you have to be careful as a melee. And definitely make sure to get out of the corners a little bit to see if there's a volcano near you, if you see any spawning, because sometimes it's very hard to see if you're pushed up against a wall. The volcanoes can technically 
be interrupted. We haven't quite figured out what causes this. I think it may just be hard CC the moment you use the volcano, but it is relatively difficult to time that properly. When they get interrupted, you will still see the volcano spawning, but they will just never detonate. If you stand on the volcano, they deal absolutely massive damage, so definitely be careful with them. Mario's next mechanic is playing some sick riffs, seriously, turn up your sound for this boss fight, it sounds so cool, and spawning a lava pool in the middle of the arena. The only areas that you can stand on are the three platforms on the side in those moments, so be careful about your positioning. You can still DPS as ranged though, so it is convenient to have a ranged offhand in this fight. I don't always run it because I like to have all the debuffing from Spear available for my team, but it's definitely convenient and effective if you have something to deal ranged damage in between phases. But once you learn this boss, you can still do plenty of melee damage to him overall, so it's not like you are forced into ranged. Both is completely possible. Marius also has an overhead attack, and I'm going to show you a quick clip of our reaction to that one here. Oh, I didn't look. Oh, oh that backswing! What? <laughs> that was the backswing? It does exist after all, okay. I don't know what exactly this attack is. He doesn't seem to do it very often at all. And this attack is absolutely brutal because it hits you well behind your normal position, making it the most dangerous attack that he has for melees in this fight. But it happens very, very rarely, so it's pretty much bad luck if you get it. Now, as I said, there's also the fire stacking debuff that is applied from pretty much all of his attacks. And in early fights, we couldn't quite figure out what this is or how this works. But basically, what happens is if you get too many stacks of fire effects on you without avoiding damage for a while or avoiding new stacks for a while, you get marked. This mark causes you to detonate after a few seconds, dealing high damage to yourself and allies close to you. I think this is actually one of the biggest struggles for new players when they get into this fight because they're not really noticing it and it deals tons of damage out of nowhere in between. Once you realize this mechanic and you are careful and learn to position well in this fight, you will very rarely ever see 10 stacks on you and that will make the fight as a whole significantly easier. But if you think this sounds like enough boss mechanics for a single fight, this is just phase 1. There is also a phase 2 where in addition to everything else that is happening, fireballs start dropping onto the platforms. They are briefly indicated by a trail of fire on the ground in the direction they're going in beforehand, as well as a big circle flame on the platform that they're going to spawn on. These things hurt. Do not stand in front of them, especially in the spot that they are spawning in. If you do, you may just get double hit or triple hit and one shot by them. There are certain situations where they seem to just hit multiple times at the moment they're a little bit bugged, and they can even one shot kill you if you haven't died in the fight before, if you are very, very unlucky. This doesn't happen that often, but you definitely don't want to be in front of them. That is the worst place to be. If you, however, stand at the side of the platform, you are much, much safer. And you don't have to stand off into the lava, just off to the side. Here, the balls will still hit you because the hitbox is weirdly larger than the circle indicates. But it's actually just a very brief knockdown that doesn't do that much damage to you. You're also able to block this damage and knockdown sometimes, which is necessary because sometimes you can't dodge to the right because the lava balls do not care if there's lava on the floor in the middle at the same time. So sometimes you may just not be able to dodge and you have to stand in the corner blocking, praying that Marius doesn't decide that now is a good moment to jump on you. If you're stuck between a fireball and the lava and Marius is spinning towards you, just hold block, you will survive, his spin doesn't do that much damage. The only time they would consider dodging towards the back wall of the platform, even though the ball is dropping in that moment, is if Marius was jumping at me with the execute move. But this is typically not what happens when the lava is up. Typically after he spawns the lava, he will do his spinning attack. So the most important thing here is not to panic and hold block if you're stuck in an awkward place. At this point of the find, we found that it's easiest if the tank tanks Marius on the side walls somewhere between the platforms. That way, if the lava spawns, you can just pull him on one side with a tank, whereas the rest of the team goes to the other side, and if he spins to the other side, then the whole team can still get healed from the healer. So it's relatively safe, and it's also a spot where he can be reliably damaged by melees most of the time, because if a ball rolls in from the other side, at this point, it's not really a big threat anymore. It doesn't do that much damage, even if it hits you, and usually it's very easy to avoid. It's very visible, very telegraphed. Also, the tank running to a separate platform will cause him to be away from Marios, which seems to incline Marios to spin towards the tank. I think the whirlwind attack only goes to other targets than the tank, if the tank is very close to him when it happens. But hey, we've had two phases, how about a phase 3? Phase 3 comes a little bit later, but doesn't change all too much. 
What is different in this phase is that there is a second lava ball spawning at the same time as the first one. So at this point two platforms will be covered by lava balls pretty much consistently. So you always are duking lava balls and you're best off just standing in a position where the lava balls aren't very often, hence the location for the tank to hold Marius most of the time. But of course now that you know all of his mechanics you will champion this fight in no time and he will not be a threat to you at all. Well, maybe still a little bit, and that is where gearing comes in. Before we get into that, a reminder that if you enjoyed the video so far, consider subscribing and clicking the bell. As some of you may know, I'm a big fan of running Onyx in my armor and expedition, and then running elemental ward matching to the type in my jewelry, along with an amulet that matches the mutation type as well. So for example, for this week's mutation, I would be running a nature protection amulet. I have four different amulets for each type, and then some additional ones for slash damage and so on for specific bosses. And for this mutation in particular, I would highly recommend having whatever amulet you need for the general type of the mutation, plus the flame protection amulet for the bosses. Both Ifrit and Marius just deal tons and tons of fire damage, and they don't deal the mutator damage, no matter what weak it is. The only thing that lingers from the mutation effects is stuff like Weary. But along with its mutator damage, there are still other damage types in the dungeon. There's the lightning mob, there is some ice damage, and most importantly, there is some fire damage from the mobs that are generally floating about, all of the lost mobs. As such, the most effective way to gear for this expedition, in my opinion, is to have some flame conditioning along, obviously, with human ward. If you chuck a few of those on your armor, then you can dedicate your jewelry to whatever the weekly mutator type is, and you will still not take too much damage from the fire elementals. In addition to that, the bosses will be significantly easier because if you put on your fire jewelry now and you have your flame conditioning, they just deal way, way, way less damage. It would be even better if you could put elemental aversion, but unfortunately you cannot roll that together with human ward. And on the topic of human ward pieces, there are multiple sets that drop from this expedition, a light focus set, a medium in set and a heavy deck set, as well as a named set from the last boss, that is heavy and strength, and then some other separate pieces. But be aware that unless you're looking to run the heavy strength set, you will not get the drops for the gloves and the boots until mutator level 10. This is true for light, medium and heavy. All of these can only drop on mutator 10. So if you are not crafting any gear or buying any other gear with human ward, then you're running on three pieces of human ward until mutation level 10. So I would recommend avoiding that. I would recommend crafting some pieces or buying some pieces for that. So you have something that you can upgrade along the way with everything else. And also to get a little bit of gear advantage without paying, there is a light helm from the quest line for this season. So that one is very good and will carry a long way that at least takes care of one of the pieces that you need. If you think this guide was useful to you, consider leaving a thumbs up, maybe subscribing or maybe supporting me on Patreon. And also, I have a question for you. Are there any skips, any specific mechanics that you found in the dungeon that I haven't mentioned here? I think there are still quite a few undiscovered things. We're still early in the process. And if you have anything to share that is not an exploit, then I would like to know. So I can include that in a more advanced version of the guide later down the road. If that advanced or expert version of the guide is already released by the time you're watching the video, it will be linked right here. Thanks to my patrons for supporting this video, and thank you for watching. Geek Sloth, out.